Galatians 5, if you would please. Good to be here this morning, amen. Good to be in church, amen. God takes it away from you and then you know what you're missing. And you say, I need to get back in church. Said by many a people who never did. I've talked to lots of people. Yeah, I need to get back in church. And then they never do it. Never do it. Do what? Yeah, I don't know what the deal is. I'm having problems already today. What's the deal with my projector? Who's done something to it? Ah, look at there. It saw me coming. That's what happened. It saw me. It keeps changing my uh, Wi-Fi connection. There we go. It keeps shutting off my Wi-Fi connection. And I don't know why. If it does it again, you just have to look in your own Bible. No, that one was planned. There. Galatians 5. Galatians 5. And then we'll be in um, Leviticus. So get Leviticus 25. So get ready to turn there. When, um, when, Paul, when Paul or any of the New Testament writers or Jesus himself spoke of keeping the keeping law or keeping the law or holding fast things. Jesus said it like this. As I have kept my father's commandments, so keep ye my commandments. Okay? Now, I've, I've encountered a lot of false doctrines in my line of work. It's my job to study them out, to see where they're wrong, to see where their hook is that they try to get in people because every, every false doctrine, these people, they, they strive to get converts after themselves. Um, I've been studying, I don't know why I'm doing it, but God just kind of leads me along every now and then. I've been studying the Branch Davidians. You remember them? Waco, David Koresh. Okay. Perfect example of a lot of things, things that you don't even know about, uh, but perfect example of how one man controls those people's thoughts. Okay, and you hear me say, it's in your Bible, you read it. Okay, you don't hear the David Koresh's and the Jim Jones and the popes of this world tell you that. They tell you, I read the Bible, I tell you what God says. I tell you, you read it for yourself. You can learn just as much from it as I can. Okay? In fact, you're responsible for it. You're responsible to know what that book says. When you get stand before God, well, brother so-and-so said this. Don't care. I gave you a Bible. Why didn't you read it? Okay? So it's a perfect example. So the, the Hebrew roots people or the Seventh-day Adventists, any kind of law-keeping Old Testament type they're mixing the Mount Sinai covenant with the Mount Zion covenant. Mount Zion's in heaven. They're mixing those two contracts. You can't do that. Not even in this world can you do that. If you ever worked a job where you were under a contract, you were under that contract. You could not go and sign another contract while that contract was in force. It's against the law. You broke the law. You broke the terms of the old contract. You can't play for two baseball teams. Of course, nobody's playing for any right now. But you can't, you can't play for two teams. You can't work for two, you can't work for Coke and Pepsi. You can't do it. In fact, if you work for Pepsi, they don't want you drinking Coca Cola. Okay? They want loyalty. So, that's the way it is. You cannot mix the old covenant with the new one. One of them is gone. One of them's out of date. Uh, one of them has been fulfilled. One of them has been done away with. 
They are competing, contradictory um, covenants. The Mount Sinai covenant said, do and you'll live. The Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem covenant says, believe and live. So they're not the same thing. So anybody who will say, well, Jesus told us to keep his commandments. His commandments are the Ten Commandments. No. He said, as I have kept my Father's commandments. Those are the Ten Commandments. My Father's commandments. Jesus kept the Ten. Because we didn't, nor can, nor ever will. Ever. He kept them, and then he gave us two commandments. Love, love. Love the Lord your God. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Love he on me. Amen? Love Sister Betty. Love my mother. Try that one for a while. Okay? Love everybody. That's the two commandments that we're under. So, um, it's the James. I have two verses out of James. You can go ahead and turn to James if you want. James tells, talks about the perfect law of liberty. And what the Hebrew covenant people do is they say, see, he says that the law, Old Testament, is liberty. But that's not what he's saying. He's talking about the new covenant, not the old. So Galatians 5.1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The yoke of bondage is the old covenant. It's bondage because you'll never, you will never satisfy God's demands. Never. It's like living with a perfectionist who has to have everything right. And the moment you set a piece of paper down crooked on the table, you're going to get it. Okay? And some people grew up in environments like that. Thank God I didn't, but some people did. So that's the way it is in the old covenant. You've got one chance. You've got one chance only to please God and everybody broke it everybody did so James says this turn to James 1 25 Hebrews James first Peter second Peter 3 John Jude and Revelation Hebrews 1 25 now, let's back up to verse 22 very quickly. Uh, James, I'm sorry. James 1.25. Yeah, Hebrews, James. Hebrews, uh, James, I did again. James 1.22. Be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So, law keepers say, see, says keep the commandments. It says do the word. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He's talking about a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. And that's how it is. The moment you walk away from the mirror, you're going, what do I look like now? And it's that way with trying to keep the Old Testament. Verse 25, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, different law. And continueth therein. Now, I do believe in a continuing faith. A continuance, salvation is a continuance in faith. Continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. How do you do? How do you do the New Testament? If it says believe. So, how do you... Um, Paul said that they've not obeyed the gospel for the Old Testament, for the law has said, who hath, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And the way to do the new covenant is to believe it. Believe what God said and continue in that belief just like you would continue in a contract. You continue it. Okay? Um, it's like paying rent. You don't pay one rent. You pay by the month, every month. And if you don't pay every month, you broke the contract. You breached it. You didn't continue therein. Now, the landlord, the Lord, can give you grace if he wants. 
it benefits him in the long run because he's got a three to six month process of getting you out, losing all that rent. So he can give you a grace period if he wants. But some people, those of you who have rented anything to anybody know that some people are going to cheat you. You're going to give them grace. You're going to give them grace and they're going to cheat you every time. And they have no intention of ever paying another dime's worth of rent. And what do you got to do? Put them out. Well, I thought you were a Christian. That's what you hear. I thought you'd pay the rent. Okay. So anyway, uh, it's a contract. It is a covenant that God makes. And our part is to continue believing. Uh, but he mentions the law of liberty. This man, he said in verse 25, shall be blessed in his deed. The law of liberty. Turn to this next chapter, chapter 2. Um, wow. Let's go back to verse 10. Here's my point. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. He's guilty of all. If the police have to come to your house and arrest you, what difference does it make? What's for? You're getting arrested. Okay? You broke the law. So he said, verse 11, For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. And who's more guilty? The adulterer or the murderer? Who's more guilty? The liar or the thief? Same. Who's more guilty? The guy that committed adultery or the guy that wanted to commit adultery? Same. Because it's covetousness. Same thing. It's breaking the law. So Paul said, verse, um, yeah, if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Verse 12, so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Law of liberty. So ask yourself this question. How, if we've been given two commandments, and those commandments are love the Lord your God and love thy neighbor as thyself. How do you do love? What is the biblical definition of love? It's actually in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. And was that gift an unconditional gift? It was to the whole world. So he offered it to the entire world without any set condition. He just said, here he is. I'll give you my only begotten son. Why? Because I love you that much. We have, a, we have an illustration of that in the book of Hosea. I, I encourage you to study the book of Hosea. It's a neat book. But Hosea is a prophet and he's told, he's commanded by God to go marry Gomer who was a whore. That was her, that's what she was. So he does it out of commandment, but he ends up loving her. He ends up loving her. And he's thinking, wow, I'm going to marry this girl and I'm going to change her life. I'm going to, I'm going to convert her. She's going to be a stay-at-home wife. She's going to raise me some children. Well, there's children there. They don't really seem to look like Hosea. And he knows that Gomer's been out every night. And then she's gone. She left. So what does Hosea do? Well, he loves her. He loves her. So he sends the children out looking for her. Go find your mother. They find her being sold as a slave in the markets. So Hosea, even though legally she's his wife, he pays the price. Buys her back. 
Why? Love. You can't help who you fall in love with. Amen? You can't help who you love. You just love them. Why do, you, why do you love that person? I don't know. I don't know. I do. I've seen husbands with some of the most evil wives. One guy in particular, I asked him, why are you with this woman? He said, I love her. And I commended him for that. I said, I understand that. By the way, the second time that Gomer was brought in, she did change. God changed her. Okay? Now, she's different. And you think Israel in that picture. She's a picture of Israel. First time around, Israel wasn't having it. Second time around, they're going to. And let me tell you, I study, I study Kabbalah. I study what I can learn from their religion, the Kabbalah. It's evil. It is pure evil. They have a concept, and I didn't know this until recently. There's a concept that some of the rabbis taught back 400 years ago that the way to, the real correct way to God is through sin. Because you're taking sin, making it part of you, and then you're going to elevate it up to God, and God will fix it. Because it's broken. And I'm just going, because some of the rabbis did that. They were absolute depraved individuals. And God foretold it. God said that's how this is going to happen. Okay? By the way, David Koresh saw himself as the sinful Messiah. He believed in being the dirty Jesus, that he had to be that. And I'm just going, you have no idea, you fool. Okay? So anyway, the law, that's how you love people. You give. What if your neighbor is constantly throwing stuff over in your yard, constantly yelling at you, constantly get onto you? He is no good. He's a jerk. You want nothing to do with him. But on his deathbed, he's asking for you to pray with him before he dies. Would you go do it? You'd have to overcome all of that. And I get it. But that's what I'm talking about. I love that man, but I'm not going to be around him. Well, what if he calls on you on his deathbed? You'd go. Or you're a liar. You don't really love him. Hey, he's getting what he deserves as far as I'm concerned. True, but then so will you. Amen? So that's what it is. That's what it is. That's the liberty that God has given us. The law of liberty is to love God freely and to give to God. So when we do this, and you don't hear me talk about this very often, but when we do this, this is not a payment for, nor is it an impayment at, in anticipation of something, the way it's displayed on television. The crooks on TV will tell you, if you sow your seed, God will bless you tenfold. So give me a thousand dollars, that means you're going to get ten thousand from God. Why don't you get ten thousand from God and give me a thousand? <laughs> Who's ever asked them that one? Once you sow a seed in my ministry, you give because you love God. You love His kingdom. You love his work, and you just do it. So that's, that's my theory. And in several years, it's paid off. I hate to use that word. But God dealt with me years ago about making merchandise of what he's given me. So I won't do it. And I don't have to. If God's in it, he blesses it. Now, there's actually a law. There was actually liberty in the law. Go back to Leviticus 25. Even though the Old Testament was a works-based blessing, there was still God's grace built into the law. Leviticus 25, the law is a foreshadow. It's a shadow of the true, but it's not itself the original. Let me tell you what some of the Hebrew 
keepers believe concerning the New Testament. They say the words are all wrong. It's not the New Testament. It's not the New Covenant. It's the renewed covenant. Now that is an entirely different word. You have a contract. And the contract, you're, you're renting an apartment. Contract says $800 a month, $1,000 a month, whatever. That's the old contract. The landlord comes to you. You've been living there 10 years. And he's going to say, you know what? You're a great tenant. Sign this new contract. I'm giving you a year free rent. You're going to live here a year. Absolutely free. Or the rest of your life, absolutely free. Which one would you... No, no thank you. I'm going to sign the old covenant. I want the old contract back. Really? I'm giving you this apartment for free. I don't care. I want the old one. But you don't understand. I'm giving you this apartment for free. There's no strings attached. Well, I don't care. I, I just, I want the old way. Okay. So you get, you sign the old contract back. And a month later, you lose your job. Who's going to pay your rent? And the landlord comes to you and says, look, I'm sorry. But I'm going to throw you out. I offered you the contract last year. I thought that I knew you. But I'm, I'm, you haven't paid rent. And I offered it to you. You chose. You chose. You signed the old contract. So you take him to court. You're going to lose. Because you signed the old contract. Not the new one. You understand that? That's the difference. So we have. You, and, but that they call the. The New Covenant, the New Testament, the Renewed Covenant, meaning they're saying that Christ points us back to Moses and the law. No, he doesn't. Moses pointed us toward Christ, not backwards. Amen? We're not going backwards, going forward. So Leviticus 25. God said in verse 8, Thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. Seven is perfection, multiplied by itself, multiplied perfection. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day. Think of something in the Bible that we're waiting for where a trumpet's going to sound. Uh, I said think about it. Are you thinking about it? Try that. See how it works. And ye shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be a jubilee unto you. And ye shall return every man into his possession. Now I'll tell you what this means. And ye shall return every man into his family. A jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. And ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed, for it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee shall you return every man unto his possession. They had, to, they had to make sure that they saved up. And God said, I will bless, I'll bless the 49th year. I'll, every, every seventh year was the Sabbath. They had to let the land rest. God said, I'll bless the sixth year. I'll give you, I'll give you twofold increase. I'll give you enough to last this year, next year, and then the year after that. If you'll just do what I said. A lot of times they didn't. So anyway, it shall be holy unto you. So they were not allowed to sow the 50th year. And they were not allowed to reap anything that came up on its own. They were not allowed to touch it. In the year of this jubilee shall every return, shall, shall, ye shall return every man unto his own possession. Here's what this means. If you look in verse 25. He's going to explain it. This has to do with the law of debt. Now, in the Old Testament days, if you owed a debt, you couldn't file bankruptcy. You couldn't go chapter 11 or chapter 12 or whatever chapters there are. You could not do that. You owed a debt. And that debt doesn't just magically go away. Somebody's, and this is what we've taught now 
a whole generation of people in this country is that you just rack up debt. I remember I had a bill collector call me when Lindsay was first born, end up in the hospital. We, we, didn't, we couldn't pay, we didn't have no insurance, couldn't pay the bill. And so a debt collector called the job that I was at and that didn't go too well. And I had a guy working there telling me, he said, you know, you don't have to pay that bill. What? So yeah, them hospitals, he said, they'll write that off. Don't, don't worry about that. I said, do you do that? Yeah, all the time. I said, I didn't, I didn't grow up that way. So I, don't, I don't live that way. I don't think that's right. If you owe the debt, who said you had the right to not pay it back? That's what all these protests were about in 2008, 2009, when the banks started repoing all these balloon mortgage houses. Remember that? And these people were protesting and they're saying, you're taking my house. You're stealing my house. Not your house. You didn't pay the bill. You didn't pay the bill. It ain't your house anymore. You signed a contract. They didn't understand that. So here was the Jubilee year. So if you owed a debt to somebody, that debt had to be paid off. And it was paid off by you going to work for this man that you owed, that you borrowed the money from. You were a debt slave. Period. Now think Bible on this. Think sin. You are a servant to sin. You owe a debt that according to scripture, not even eternity can pay off the debt. That's how big a debt you have. Think about it. You, you accumulated an everlasting debt, meaning that if it, let's say we, let's say there was a purgatory. How long would it take for you in purgatory to pay off your sin debt? Eternity. Eternity. So to say to God, God, I'll, I'll do good deeds. I promise. I promise I'll do good deeds. That won't clear the debt. Because the moment, watch this, the moment you sin after you do good deeds, all your good deeds are gone. Because now you have another debt, a whole. It's like when they give somebody five. We gave him five life sentences. Ha! Yeah, but he's only going to live one. You can't get four more out of him. So that's eternity. And that's what sin is. So the law said you had to work until that debt was paid off. So here's what God said on that. Verse 25. If thy brother be waxen poor and has sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. So let's say that you sold your horses to your first cousin for money. The Jubilee year... The cousin had to give the horses back. Then let him, verse 27, then let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return his, unto his possession. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of Jubilee. And in it, and in the Jubilee, it shall go out and he shall return unto his own possession. What you lost you'll get back. Now, let's spend a little moment thinking about all the things that we lost because of sin. All the people, all the opportunities, money, possessions, freedom, all the things we lost that sin took away from us. It's a lot. When we get there, God's going to restore it. But it won't, you won't, don't worry. You're not going to get that dog back or whatever. You're going to get brand new stuff. Everlasting stuff. That's God. Amen? 
Verse uh, 29, if a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year, he may redeem it. In other words, he can buy it back if he pay the price. And if it be not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled city shall be established forever to him that bought it throughout his generations. It shall not go out in the Jubilee. But the houses of the villages, which have no wall around about them, shall, by the way, when we go to heaven, what kind of city is it? It's a walled city. It's a walled city. So stop and think about this for a minute. Has anybody ever sold? Has anybody ever sold out their possession in heaven? Remember what Esau did? What did he trade his birthright for? which was his everlasting possession. He would have had that in his family forever. It would have been Edom in Jerusalem and not Israel, not Jacob. Esau sold out his rights to the land forever for one bowl of food. So ask, ask the question, has anybody ever sold out their chance to live in heaven forever for the things of this world. People do it every day. Every day people do this. They're offered eternal life with a chance to live in a house in a walled city. And they sell it out because they want their best life now. I want it here, God. I don't want to have to wait. It's the prodigal son I want my inheritance now I don't have to wait for it so he gave it to him uh, verse 31 the houses of the villages which have no wall round about them shall be counted as the fields in the country that they may be redeemed and they shall go out in the jubilee notwithstanding the cities of the Levites and the houses of the cities of their possession may the Levites redeem at any time it's because they're Levites, they weren't given a possession of land. And if a man purchased of the Levites, then the house that was sold in the city of his possession, so go out in the year of Jubilee. For the houses of the cities of the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. And it was to remain in their possession forever. But the field of the suburbs or the, of their cities may not be sold, for it is their perpetual possession. This is why Naboth could not sell his vineyard to King Ahab. Right there, the field of the suburbs of their cities may not be sold, for it is their perpetual possession. Naboth told Ahab, God forbid it me. I cannot sell my vineyard. I can't trade it to you for what you say is a better one. If it's a better one, why don't you keep it? Okay? So Naboth stood his ground, lost his head over it, but he stood his ground. He did what's right. Now look in verse 39. If thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant, but as an hired servant and as a sojourner, he shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. Then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him and shall return unto his own family and unto the possession of his father shall he return. You, it, on the year Jubilee, all the servants were released. The slaves set free. Was Abraham Lincoln right? In the Emancipation Proclamation? You better believe he was. He set at liberty the captives. One of, not the only, but one of the biggest scars on America was slavery. Okay? Should have never... Our forefathers came to this land because they didn't want to serve the Church of England and the Church of Rome. And they didn't want Bloody Mary, Queen of Scots, killing them either. Because she was. Because she was Roman Catholic. And they came to this land for freedom and liberty. And if it's good for one man, it's good for all men. Okay? Um, verse 42. For they are my servants. 
I don't know if I read verse 41. Then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, shall return unto his own family, unto the possession of his father shall he return. For they are my servants which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. Thou shalt not rule over them with rigor, but shalt fear thy God. Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall you buy bondmen and bondmaids. Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which ye begat in your land, and they shall be your possession, and ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession, and they shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, ye shall not rule one over another with rigor. Now, I don't have time to get into the rest of this, but he talks about setting captives free and my favorite part of this, and I've talked about this before, that let's say that you owed a debt to your brother, your cousin, your uncle, whatever, so you go work for him to pay off the debt. Jubilee year, he is to release you. Or when the debt has been cleared, he is to release you. He's not to hold on to you. Slavery still goes on in this world, by the way. And I found out there's, there's an app that people are using to buy and sell people. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Okay? Yeah. It's still done. Big time. Um, but anyway, so let's say that you inherited land. You, work, you had to go to work for your brother because your farm didn't turn out very good. You went to work for your brother. Jubilee year comes, he sets you free. But you're going, you know what? I'm a lousy farmer. I ain't going to make it. So you know your brother or your cousin or whoever treated you well. You have a right to go back to them. This time you're not a bond servant. You don't owe a debt. Debt's been paid. You go back as a freed servant and say I want to serve you you were good to me and my family you took us in you fed us you clothed us you took care of us I love working for you I want to work for you for the rest of my life they would bore a hole in your ear and put a jewel in there, a ring of some kind that meant that you were possessed by this man but you were there by choice and it wasn't slavery it was service, free will service. There's a difference. There is a difference. This is who we are. We're not serving God to pay our debt off. Our debt was paid already. And we don't owe it. He's not holding it against us. Amen? So we go back to him and say, Father, I serve you because you, of what you've already done for me. And I love living in your house, and I love serving your house, and I hold to this, I will serve you the rest of my life. Amen? I love that. Father, we all want to be free, each in our own way. We want the liberty that Christ gives us, not to do evil. But a change in heart... Father, that we want to do righteousness. And that's all we want to do. So, Father, we gladly serve you. We gladly honor you with all that we are, all of our substance, and every moment of our life belongs to you. Not out of debt. And, Father, we don't expect a reward. We've already been given the reward. We serve you, Father, for the same reason why you gave to us. We serve you because we love you. And whether you gave us anything else in this world, we would still do it. Because you've already given us your precious son. That's more than we could ever ask for. So gladly, Father, not begrudgingly, gladly, we get up. We come to the house of God. Gladly we pray. Gladly we read our Bible. Gladly we serve you. Thank you, God, for letting us do that, for writing that in the law. 
May your word be blessed, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.